Hi, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for the invitation to talk to you today about mental health and HIV. I'm a clinician based in Central Johannesburg um, at Fitz University, um, and I'm glad you actually pushed me a little bit on to give this talk because it's forced me to re-examine a whole of the stuff that um, I've previously taught around. Um, in terms of my disclosures, uh, my commercial disclosures and research disclosures are there, but the two most important disclosures, the first one is that I'm a clinician. I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not a mental health specialist or public health policy person, even though I do a lot of that stuff. Um, and that gives a certain level of, uh, of uh, uh, restrictions in terms of my understandings of some of these things. I'm also not, get, I've decided not to talk about classifications of mental illness, um, about drugs or drug-drug interactions. And I've kept the epidemiology very limited. And I'll explain why, because a lot of that stuff you can just look up. And I think I'd be more interested to just share my experiences around particularly around screening um, for various diseases within um, HIV clinics and particularly around um, mental, uh, mental health. Well, the first thing, and just one of the reasons I didn't want to talk about epidemiology is somebody who did this so much better is Robert um, Remian from Columbia University. He had a superb talk um, two or three years ago at the Amsterdam IAS conference about um, the global burden of, uh, of mental, um, mental health, neurological and substance use disorders, all of which are obviously Integrates and he, he made some really first of the talk itself is really worth going to listen to, but secondly, had some really interesting um, observations around the epidemiology. Firstly, that people with this constellation of mental, neurological, and substance use disorders um, have up to a 15 to 20 year shorter lifespan. So we are talking about a very vulnerable group of people. And that something I've never noticed before, I really should have, is that the burden of mental health disease. And, and risk is actually exactly the same as the burden of HIV risk. And the two overlaps are so beautifully shown here in terms of this graph that you put out there. And that we are talking about groups of people, particularly younger people, where there is a very high prevalence of mental health problems and things that need to be addressed. So we are all talking about getting to 1990 and getting viral loads undetectable, so nobody transmits the virus. Um, that means nuclear level adherence. And we know that, uh, you know, mental um, illness is actually a real obstacle to all of this. Firstly, um, we know that people with mental illnesses come to, um, are high risk to get to acquiring HIV, and particularly when there's substance use in the mix. Um, interestingly enough, and fairly consistently across the cohorts, people with mental illness also have a much higher mortality rate if they're HIV positive. Um, and there, I found studies from as wide a field as the US and Tanzania um, demonstrating that people were depressed, and this is just one of the mental um, conditions that they, they looked at, had this much higher um, um, mortality rate. And I just put an observation there that if we were talking about an ARV side effect or about tuberculosis, it probably would be taken a lot ser more seriously if this um, observation was, was, was extrapolated to, to mental health. Um, adherence is really important, as we all know, and critical to the viral suppression project. But and there's every aspect of uh, mental health, from depression to anxiety to, to substance use, is associated with adherence. But it's often very poorly tailored, particularly the primary health care, where these kind of one-size-fits-all adherence interventions are put in place. So what about HIV and current care? And this obviously um, is, um, my experience is lower middle-income country settings where the vast majority of care is actually administered in a primary care setting, often in a non, um, in a very sort of broad primary care setting, not in an HIV clinic, specialist HIV clinic. And where add-ons, particularly to things like HIV, disease-specific areas, is actually very, very difficult. Um, I just wanted, as a clinician, just to put something, a couple of controversial points out there, is that one of the things that antiretroviral treatment is actually really simple, and that I often find that... Um, even though not to say adherence isn't critical, but drug side effects and drug resistance is often exaggerated as a um, as a reason as something to be talking about um, in terms of, of obstacles to, to achieving um, adherence levels. And often um, it's quite distracting from what is often what needs to be talked about, which is uh, mental health issues and um, the social determinants of health. The other thing to be observant of is that there are other classic comorbidities, the cryptococci and um, TB patients, pneumonia patients, as well as these organic diseases, often very loosely and lazily called AIDS dementia, um, are also often exaggerated and again can be very distracting and in fact is very unhelpful. We don't talk about diabetes dementia or um, epilepsy dementia, you know, but people are very happy to talk about AIDS dementia. Um, which, as I said, is firstly unhelpful because there's not much you can do about it, but also it's like often 
um, people's mental abilities are masked by the fact that they're severely ill and clinicians find it very easy to call, talk about AIDS dementia. This late presentation should also be a marker of, um, of mental disorders and should be seen as such. So just to flag that it's some organic stuff that doctors spend a lot of time discussing is actually not that important to my mind. And a lot of this gets in the way of having a discussion about what actually are the adherence challenges, which is our biggest challenge um, at a clinical level. We're also seeing that life expectancy is, getting, um, is increasing and is starting to approach normal. And as you get older, a whole lot of other mental health issues kick in. I've put a few here, obesity, which is a major problem um, in successfully treated HIV patients, across the sexual function and issues around family and how people are going to be remembered. All of these things figure in terms of HIV um, and mental health. In context, not I don't need to tell this audience, is absolutely everything. And that you cannot um, extrapolate context from London to Delhi to Johannesburg. And that the populations we deal with vary widely in the mental um, disorders that we see very mildly. And whether you're working with MSM or whether you're working with trans populating populations or injecting drug users or adolescent women, these things are all difficult to simply have a one size fits all. Also, what is the problem is often the identification of mental disorders is located within the clinic, while the context is very far away from the clinic. And the things that are driving that mental disorder often simply are, are removed from, from people who have very little experience. The healthcare workers and certainly the public health planners um, are often not, um, are not living in those communities which are experiencing that mental disorder. I gave this talk about um, 10, 12 years ago, and um, I was looking, I found the slide this morning. I'm just shocked at how little attention there I paid to these social determinants. You can see there's tons and tons of biological stuff on the talk I gave on adherence, but very little attention to the things which I would now argue are far, far more important than all these, these um, issues around drugs and, and their potency. Um, Robert again did this amazing slide, which I think is much better representation of the things we are we look at. And it's quite amazing when you look at sort of I'm not going to read these three with you. You probably know them all and could probably put the slide together yourselves. But it's often amazing that our patients have any sort of mental health to, to support them when you look at the kind of challenges that they have to deal with. And again, he's what's beautiful about the slide is he's he's put the biological issues there out on the left and they are important and not to be disregarded, but all the other stuff that, that surrounds our patients is probably far, far more important. So just some observations and I've been de dealing with screening programs in HIV clinics for a very long time. So just, uh, they are sound slightly cynical. And one of them is that patients are, like everyone talks about mental health, you know, whether it's the politicians or the public health people, but very little actually practically and, and usefully gets done about it. Um, and what's very important is with every time it's a mental health major day, you know, our politicians love to stand up, and particularly our health politicians, and talk movingly about how important this all is. But there are very few resources that are actually focused on mental health issues. And we really, even at the level of politicians, but at the level of public health policy or even um, um, you know, at the issue of guidelines, we don't talk about issues that relate to mental health, such as social isolation. You can find a a guideline for every area of, of, of health, hypertension, smoking, you name it. But you won't find a guideline on, on things that we know impact on mental health, like social isolation. You won't find things on how to improve your, your patient's um, you know, sort of network of, of, of friends and family and things like that. And this is really important to understand is why we have so few interventions and guidance in terms of what to do. The other thing we, that is, I do sound quite cynical, it's particularly because I work in the ARV fields, I'm quite shocked at how at how the psychiatric drugs, and particularly the ones for common disorders like depression and anxiety, how they're not great. You know, they've got low side effects. They work in a minority of people. I don't want to undermine them because I think they, you know, they are in the individual patients that you certainly can work. And I've seen wonders work. But we do need to have honest honesty about the fact that, you know, we need better drugs out there. And the other thing, um, one of the worst things happening in post-apartheid South Africa in the last two or three years was the, what we call the last is the mainly scandal is because we have so few advocates for mental health um, um, in the activist community and in the in the, the, the clinician community and this is where over 100 patients died when they were um, transferred from care facility from one care facility to another in the process died of you know just lack of water and food and under the most dreadful dreadful circumstances that have led to a class action lawsuit against the South African government and in many ways, it's much easier to do a hypertension trial where you treat the blood pressure or look at adherence and measure pull boxes than it is to address the social determinants. But we must remember that a lot has been accomplished. I'm going to talk about the guidelines in detail in this section, but in, this, in a moment. But the, 
Yeah, I think that the HIV community is quite activist minded. And a lot of us do recognize that the social determinants and the context in which people exist is really important and that mental illness um, in, exists in that context. And I think that that's trickled over. I think activists got it within 10 seconds flat because they, were, they, they saw the impact on it and slowly leaking into donors, agencies, governments, and into policy more broadly, that they have to start taking mental health issues more, more seriously. And it's, you know, in the HIV world, things like AIDS, dementia, as I mentioned, is like a lazy diagnosis. The term HIV infected is less and less acceptable, but you see so much of the stigmatizing language in the mental health space. Um, and this ghastly term, all you need is a forest and a pair of running shoes, these kind of happiness memes that, that sort of circulates as if, you know, people don't need help, that they don't need specialist help, they need pharmaceutical help, a whole range of complex health. health. And in South Africa, for instance, the stigmatization leaks into real care, where if you um, have an unsuccessful suicide attempt, your medical insurance will not pay for the consequences of that. They'll pay happily for your lung cancer treatment if you've smoked your entire life, but they won't pay for the, you know, for the fact that you might need ICU after an overdose. And these are the kind of things I think need to be addressed. We also are seeing the rise, and I think this is massive thing of people, celebrities, sports stars, this young tennis star that came out and said she was not participating in, in one of the, the recent tennis events. Um, and Bogani Moyosi, a famous cardiologist in South Africa, who is one of the nicest human beings, committed suicide a few years ago, and electrified the South African medical community, where they, for the first time people were talking about the stresses of being a, you know, a, a, a young professional um, in the health community. And I think these things are really important to be milking as we go forward. And finally, COVID, you know, the issues around isolation and lockdown has brought mental health issues to the fore in a way that we've never seen before. But guidelines, I, I've been going through all our guidelines, the international and the local ones, and all of them actually do pay attention to um, the context, the social determinants around issues around mental health, um, substance use in particular, and adherence. And you might be a bit cynical and say it's just lip service, but do you think the community, you won't find this in cardiology guidelines or diabetes guidelines, is a lot of attention to the context of mental health. And the clinic, I was going through the Southern African Clinician Society guidelines. I'm really proud of them. They've got specific guidelines addressing mental health disorders in both adults and children, but also issues around the trans community and gender affirming guidelines, um, been huge advocates for getting hormones into the public sector in South Africa. And then also for harm reduction, for intravenous drug use and for other use of, of substances, all being driven by the HIV community, not the, the more conventional community. So we do need to ask ourselves, why is mental health screening so poor? And the first thing to acknowledge is that screening for all conditions is poor. It's what I do is trying to get hypertension, breast cancer screening. It's next to impossible to get these screening programs in. And we'll talk about why in a moment. But one of the first things is that there's very little respect for pay pay health workers' constraints. You've got a long clinic in front of you. And people often minimize the amount of work required. And they'll say, oh, it's easy. It just takes four minutes to administer this questionnaire. When there are six or seven other questionnaires that need to be administered, both from a whole range of vested interests in terms of, of screening. And they could push this onto some of the busiest people in our primary health care um, networks. We often ask for screening for things I've realized are not evidence or priority based. And that often we'll screen for things where there's no intervention available. And that needs to be thought about when we start pushing for what we need to have. We need to acknowledge also that healthcare workers are not happy with awkward topics. And it's all very well to talk about, um, you know, that the patient's well in antiretrovirals and then have to, in, uh, you know, start discussing their sexual health and gender-based violence and their mental health issues and depression and suicide ideation, things like that. And the question where there's a long queue standing right behind you. And I think that we need to acknowledge how hard these conversations actually are. A lot of the mental health language, I was going through the guidelines last night, is really not that easy to use and not in commonplace, it's not commonplace in the clinics that I work in. And we need to be thinking about how do we make them less, um, you know, to make them more affluent and, and familiar to people. We also need to acknowledge that our referral network, so even if you pick somebody up who's suicidal or has severe depression, there's in fact, mostly a non-existent referral network. And again, we are asking nurses and doctors to screen for diseases where there's nothing to be done for them because you, you just have, no, you know, there's just um, these referral networks to psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists just don't actually exist. And I, I have patients coming to me complaining that they're hungry, they've lost their jobs, their husbands beat them. And you know, the context is sometimes so overwhelming that it's quite hard to even ask the, the probing questions to find out in case 
I don't have a place to send them. And this is why we need to be thinking about the context in which people with mental illness, uh, illness exist. So we've seen, um, so we need to also ask why resources are so poor. And part of this is um, the fact that it's of advocacy and policy failure, but it's also that mental health just doesn't have the, the strong advocacy around it that say TB and HIV has now acquired. And I was talking to my UK friends talking about how it's so easy for the public health people to slowly remove the resources. So where you would have a social worker with a, you know, with 20 or 30 people that they were responsible for, suddenly it will be 40 or 50. And this dismantling of the networks um, around mental health is actually in richer countries, a fairly predictable thing that you see happening across the, the, the board. So what's the problem with treatment? Well, again, as I said, um, this advocacy and stigma attached to it. And again, often these treatment programs are dismantled quietly in the background. A lot of what we do in, um, is available to the average nurse and doctor in primary care and secondary care is to start the drugs and slowly increase them, particularly in the case of depression drugs. But that doesn't work well in primary care where the patients come back every three or six months. And again, these treatment algorithms are often out of whack and out of line with, um, with the, the way care is actually put forward. Now, I've mentioned the lack of re referral networks, and it's not just for mental health, it's for everything in primary health care. And often the focus of donors, of research institutions has been very much on severe disease, not on the everyday anxiety, depression, PTSD that people actually experience in the clinics. And I'm actually quite, as somebody who does a lot of drug um, antiretroviral research, I'm quite discouraged by how little research is done on these psychiatric drugs um, within these, these priority populations. So some things to think about. Um, I think that we need to recognize in the discussions going forward today is that any screening at the primary healthcare level is likely to fail. And that's been my experience, as I said, across the board. And hypertension is one of the easiest things to screen for. But unless we radically change how we, how we do primary care and secondary care, we really are not going to see an improvement in mental health screening going forward. And we really need to be thinking far more laterally and creatively before we start saying, this is the way to go, it's just strengthening the screening problem. And I've been involved in lots of different interventions for, as I said, for lots of screening, including for mental health screening. And we need to be thinking maybe the site of the intervention just needs to be different. It needs to be um, pushed out to, I don't know, employers, into homes, into churches, who knows? But I think we just need to be thinking beyond the realm of conventional clinics. The use of technology is very exciting. I'm very encouraged by the use of some of these mental health apps that have come out. We need to be thinking about what is what do we need? What high intensity, where do we go between short and long interventions? And what are the interventions? And um, I'm thinking about what's different between preventative and, um, and treatment. There's a lot of moralism in public health, and I've seen a lot of it creeping into the substance use discussions where things like alcohol are just kind of lumped in, cigarette smoking are lumped in with a whole range of other drugs. Um, and being very clear about whose responsibility it is for, for dealing with the fact that people are using substances. Public health loves one size fits all. And um, I'm afraid, again, we need to be very careful around this. And we see it with adherence all the time, but you also see it with people who advocate just generalized happiness programs being um, pushed into to clinics where many of the patients actually don't need them. And the ones who do need them need a far more focused program. And I think we need to be honest about if we don't have something to offer, we mustn't. And if we can't get the referral systems going, we must be acknowledge the harm that does to the healthcare system and the healthcare worker if finding disease that you can do nothing about. And I think that we need to be thinking creatively about how to do that. The other thing is we must stop minimizing how hard our interventions are, particularly the screening programs. Um, and if something is going to be hard, acknowledge that and make sure that it's properly resourced. This kind of, it's only three minutes or four minutes to do the screen nonsense, but stop now. And that, that is not a reason to do nothing. We need to keep the pressure on around mental health, but that does mean that, that we need to be more practical and pragmatic about the interventions that we are, we are focusing on. So my final thoughts are that, HIV does provide a real platform for challenging the mental health status quo and for starting to ask the harsh questions that we need to have. The public disclosures um, from celebrities and from sports stars, the scandals like the life is the many thing and COVID has thrust mental health really to the front of the agenda. We really need to occupy that space and start insisting on the resources and the applications and the, the implementation of resources. But we need measurable things that we can actually use for that. And this is where I think the challenge is, is that if, as long as we have stuff where it's all platitudes and it's vague, mental health is important to all of us, that is not going to cut it anymore. We need things where we can hold donors, governments, clinicians, feet to the fire in terms of getting things to get, um, get done within the clinical space and the outcomes to be measured for our patients are actually things that, can, that they actually make a difference.
And with that, I look really forward to the rest of the seminar and to hearing all your creative ideas. Thank you very much.